One of the things that we've done over the course of the last uh, uh, two lectures is I've talked about the extent to which Russia, and I've, I've, I've really tried to drive this point home, that Russia's experience in the closing decades of the 19th century and the opening decades of the 20th century are really European experiences. Russia is undergoing a process of modernization, of transformation, of, in, of uh, economic, industrial, and cultural development that is very much in line with similar processes that unfolded in Europe simultaneously or earlier, uh, you'd say in Central Europe and Western Europe. From the standpoint of industry, it's a bit more pronounced. We know that the British original industrial revolution begins unfolding in the middle of the 18th century. Russia's occurs at the very end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century, but it is a process of rapid industrialization that sees Russia's transformation along the lines of a modern industrial economy. With growing rates of urbanization, growing rates of industrial productivity, the concentration of populations in urban areas, the movement between the village and the countryside, and with it, and with it, all of the technological and scientific markers of progress that we associate with places like Germany, uh, like France, like the United States, or like Great Britain. These things emerge in Russia, and in some cases, in some isolated cases, the Russians demonstrate a capacity to be every bit as creative, every bit as industrious, every bit as inventive as their Western European counterparts. I talked at some length last week about Vladimir Shuhu, uh, the, the great uh, civil and architectural engineer at the, of the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century. And I made a case that Shulkov is one of those unknown figures, at least up until last week he was unknown to you, but who really should be accounted among the leading uh, inventors, the leading engineers of Europe at that time uh, and that, at that place. The, Russia's problem, of course, has traditionally been that it has lagged behind. Its development comes slightly later. And once the technologies arrive, whether it is the steam engine, whether it is the railroad, whether it is the telephone or the automobile, those technologies make their initial appearance in Russia effectively at the same time, or very, very soon after, they make their appearance first in Europe or the United States. The problem has been historically the extent to which those new technologies and the new technological systems have difficulty in the Russian context economic, political, social, cultural context, diffusing beyond the major capital centers, the major capital cities like St. Petersburg and Moscow. So that Kiev, I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, Kiev gets its first electric tram in 1892, very shortly after the appearance of electric trams um, in the late 1880s in the West. The automobile arrives in Russia, the first Russian-built automobile, 1896 hot on the heels of the display of Benz's yellow at the 1893 uh, exhibition uh, the, uh, in Chicago, the Columbia Exposition. Okay. The same thing can be true for radio. It is true for uh, steamboats we had talked about earlier, and true for steam engines as well. Russians are participating then in the years prior to first, the First World War. They are encountering an ever-widening array of technologies, and technologies are transforming everyday Russian lives after the fashion they have already begun to transform lives of the metropolitan inhabitants of, say, Berlin, London, or even New York. And along with these unfolding new technologies, the material changes, the real significant material changes that are underway at this, Russia, at this time in Russia, are going to be chronicled as well in what is, by 1905, 1906, an absolutely burgeoning uh, periodical press. It is at this point in the decade or so before the onset of World War I that the Russian press really emerges as a mass circulation phenomenon. The Russian mass circulation press balloons to around 1,158 newspapers and more than 2,500 journals printed across the empire on the eve of World War I. And by 1913, the year before the start of the Great War, the imperial press has become finally a vibrant and very important part of that knowledge economy that we've talked about time and time again in here. It makes possible the diffusion of technological culture by disseminating information about the latest advances, providing a forum for ordinary subjects to comment, and also then providing access to information. We talk about a burgeoning uh, periodical press, daily newspapers, weekly gazettes, is that there's hardly a day, there's hardly a week that passes 
without technological inspired stories appearing in the leading uh, newspapers. Provincial news outlets from Sevastopol all the way to Vladivostok are going to run regular news sections that communicate uh, information about newfangled automobiles and after 1907, 1908, airplanes. There are even by 1912 and 1913 dozens of specialized journals, journals with names like Heavier Than Air, Behind the Wheel, or Cinephoto for, 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 for motion pictures that are specifically devoted to, to lovers and enthusiasts of particular technologies. And they provide a great deal of in-depth coverage of these specialized subjects. Technological images are also going to appear with increasing frequency in advertisements. There are advertisements for inflatable rubber tires, for electric light bulbs, for gramophones. And what this suggests at the outset of the 20th century is that if there are advertisements for these types of devices, there must clearly be a growing number of consumers. Or at least there's a hope that there's a growing number of consumers because these things are being advertised. But public interest in things technological um, is at such a high level that even when you have items that are being sold by advertisers that do not have a particular direct link to technology, we find advertisers utilizing uh, their uh, advertisements as a way of trying to connect their technology to the desires of their consumers. This particular advertisement, to give you an example here of, of, a, of a technology related, directly related advertisement from about 1909, 1910. It is an advertisement from the Treugolnik, or the, the Triangle Factory. A Treugolnik is a triangle, three corners. Uh, advertising uh, rubber transmission belts that can be used in farm machinery. And this tells us a number of different things. First of all, uh, it's, in, it's in brilliant color which is kind of interesting. It's the first time we're going to see a, little, a few color advertisements today. But it suggests here the extent to which finally mechanical devices and mechanization are beginning to affect and influence in a positive way the countryside. Why do you advertise your rubber transmission belts for um, agricultural machinery? Because there are folks out there who are purchasing these things and using them to undertake increasingly mechanized agriculture. It's one thing, however, for there to be advertisements of technological devices that are for sale. What I think is every bit as interesting about this particular point in Russian cultural history is the extent to which advertisers, as I've already uh, alluded to, who are advertising products that are not technologically related, utilize technological images as a way of trying to reach their audiences. For example, this particular advertisement for beer uh, and different kinds of waters, uh, like seltzer waters and things like that, from the uh, Shevolovsky factory incorporates an airplane for some odd reason. What does an airplane have to do with beer or with, with, uh, with uh, drinking liquids? Nothing. Okay. Other than the fact that the advertiser, the company believes, or the, the company that they've hired to advertise their products believe that by linking the sale of beer and, and various kinds of, of sodas and waters to the airplane, you can attract readers' interest and readers' attention. So the airplane is bringing in uh, these wonderful things. Okay. It attests here to the extent to which uh, advertisers now are utilizing technological images as a way of trying to reach broader consumer audiences, okay. giving evidence here that people are simply interested in technological things. Now, there are other instances. I don't, have, I don't have pictures of all of these things. But to give you another example, there is a, a cologne company known as the Kohler Company their 1909 sales pitch uh, depicts, similar to this one, a dirigible, like a, like a big Zeppelin, uh, floating over Moscow. And the tagline for Kohler Cologne is, higher in quality than all other colognes. The idea here that you're linking here the soaring dirigible to the cologne, trying to make that relationship between being higher in quality, higher in the air. Cigarette manufacturers did the same things. You would see uh, advertisements for cigarettes in which telephone poles or telegraph poles take the form of cigarettes all lined up in a row. What in the world does this have to do with smoking? I don't know. I'm not exactly sure. Other than there's this attempt, a conscious attempt, to link technology to this growing consumerism and to suggest that both of these things, the consumerist activity, is part of the modern new metropolitan lifestyle just as the technologies 
that pervade the urban environment, the, the streetcars, the trams, later the automobiles, the telephones, the telegraphs. So consumers are going to be drawn to technology. We've already seen, uh, we did last week, the workers who were drawn to technology. We've talked about the rise uh, of a growing technical and scientific elite uh, in the form of our, our, our students in polytechnic institutes, our professionals like Piotr Palczynski. Consumers, creative elites, professionals are enthralled by the age of synergies, mechanical marvels. And this phenomenon mirrors developments that are, that are occurring in Western Europe simultaneously or that emerged a year or two or maybe five years earlier, these things make their way to Russia. This is they had seized a hold of the popular imagination in Europe, it seizes a hold of the popular imagination in Russia. And in Russia, telephones, electric trams, motor cars, moving pictures, these begin to alter the way people see, think about, and relate to the world at large. There's a growing attempt on the part of people to make sense of the world around them. What does all of this mean? This new age of speed and age of motion. And people really are experiencing and living the world in a different way than they had previously. They are traveling in different modes. They are communicating in different ways. And if you can think from your standpoint, imagine what it would be like never to text again. That would be great because it wouldn't disrupt class from my standpoint. But if you think about the ways in which we communicate today and how different it was from, say, 15 or 20 years ago, we've experienced, your generation has been part of this, this new communications revolution. Well, the, the, the young men and women, the, 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 the teens, the early 20s, the mid-20s, the early 30s folks, who were growing up during this time, they too are living through a revolution, and the more educated and the more culturally or artistically inclined among them are trying to make sense of what all of these things mean. They're doing this in Russia, they're doing this in Europe as well. And the accompanying effort to comprehend and to make sense and to represent this new age of speed and, and dynamism that's being introduced by the era's technological novelties is going to give rise to new forms of art, new aesthetic sensations and new aesthetic principles that radically break with the past and that helped to contribute to, um, to the emergence of what we would recognize today as a new modern form of consciousness. Now, the revolution in art is going to be based upon revolutionary new perspectives and perceptions that are influenced directly by scientific and technological discoveries. One of the important ones in this regard is the discovery of x-rays. And I've, I've talked briefly about this in the past, and I'll say one more thing about it in this regard. Wilhelm Röntgen's discovery of x-rays in 1895 followed 10 years later in 1905 by Albert Einstein's theory of relativity. These two events in particular helped break down long-standing ideas about the homogeneity of space and time. In revealing the inner contents of the human body, as Hand mit Ringen does very clearly, you can see this is the very first medical x-ray, and here's, here's the hand, and here's the ring on the finger showing you inside, delving inside the human body. Röntgen rays, as x-rays were, were called for a time, they began to blur the distinction between sort of the interior and the exterior of things. And there are artists in Western Europe and artists later in Russia who are going to use these kinds of discoveries uh, as, as launching pads for, for inspirational new forms of art. If an x-ray could penetrate into the interior of a human body and show you what was hidden, why could not a, a, a painter attempt to do the same thing? The advent of, of moving pictures, filmmaking, is going to have a similar effect. Filmmakers can do different things than the painter of a static portrait can do. The filmmaker can offer multiple shifting vantage points on screen, it can disrupt spatial perceptions through what we call today special effects. By using editing techniques and things like that, you can use uh, stop motion animation, uh, you can use a long exposure, um, you can simply do an abrupt cut and you can make it appear on screen as if the woman disappears into thin air or appears out of thin air. 
simply by, by, by editing the film. These are the types of things that are going to encourage artists, traditional artists, to begin experimenting with their uh, traditional art forms. The most influential experiments of the period are going to be undertaken by a fellow named Pablo Picasso, who is going to d invent, along with uh, a man by the name of Georges Braque, a new approach to painting called Cubism. What Cubism does is it abandons linear perspective, linear perspective of, of drawing and painting that had held sway over Western art since the 15th century. The foundational painting of the Cubist movement is this, Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, painted by Pablo Picasso in 1907. Uh, you can see this um, at the, the Museum of Modern Art in New York. This is where it is. I think it's housed on permanent display there. I don't think it travels. It's, it, it's part of the MoMA uh, uh, collection. And here it is. One of the most revolutionary artistic uh, uh, paintings uh, in uh, certainly of, uh, of the 20th century. What this particular painting did is it employed uh, this new so-called cubist technique which aimed to portray in a multiplicity of spaces from multiple perspectives simultaneously the x-ray-like views of the interior and exterior of three-dimensional objects. And this is what, what, what Picasso is attempting to do in this and other cubist paintings is to solve the conundrum that the traditional canvas painter, the canvas artist, has. If you paint a picture of a woman, you're not able on that two-dimensional canvas to capture the three-dimensional reality of the figure you're painting. Now, your painting may look realistic because it uses that traditional linear perspective, but that itself is a form of artifice. We talked about linear perspective in here earlier, the idea of a vanishing point going off into the horizon. Is the thing that looks smaller on that vanishing point further away from you? Of course it's not. It's an illusion. This too is an illusion, but it's an illusion that attempts to sort of square the circle of how you portray three dimensions on what is a two-dimensional surface. So that what you end up doing in this particular painting, uh, which is scandalous to begin with because uh, what uh, Picasso has chosen as his subjects, these are a group of prostitutes in a brothel. Not the sort of thing that you normally would portray in polite company. But here we see in particular, they've got funny shaped noses that look askance as if you're looking at them from different angles simultaneously. So that you're looking at this one front on, but her nose is off to the side, suggesting here the fact that, well, the nose exists in three dimensions. Here, this figure at the bottom right has her head turned completely around, <coughs> underscoring the fact that there is a face on the other side that you can't see. She's been painted with a primitive, uh, almost African mask-like uh, visage in part because of Picasso's interest in African and non-European art, which is also part of this trying to bring the, the modern three dimensions together with the, uh, the quote-unquote uh, primitive uh, uh, of traditional art forms. Cubism is, is not the only contemporary artistic movement that is influenced by new technologies. Another one, and, and, and the, the artistic movement that is most directly influenced by technology, because we understand this is he's influenced by technology, but it's not just technology that Picasso is focusing on. The artistic movement in Europe that is going to focus on technology and that is going to almost fetishize technology is futurism, futurism, which is launched uh, by an Italian poet by the name of Filippo Tommaso Marinetti. Um, just actually a, a few months after uh, Picasso first finished uh, his, uh, his famous Cubist painting. Marinetti is going to take to the pages in a very modern way. He's going to take to the pages of a newspaper, Le Figaro, in Paris, to announce the founding of a new artistic movement. He's not just going to paint something or, or write a poem. He's going to advertise it in something known as the Founding Manifesto of Futurism. So he writes a statement that openly embraces the material wonders of the age of synergy. And part of that manifesto, the very most famous part of the manifesto, proclaims that a roaring car whose hood is adorned with great pipes like serpents of explosive breath is more beautiful than the victory of Samothrace. <laughs> 
Victory of Samothrace is an ancient uh, Greek sculpture uh, depicting the goddess uh, Nike, goddess of victory. No head on it, used to be, but no more. His point here is, the point that Marinetti is trying to make, is that the modern creations, modern technological creations that are emerging out of industry have an aesthetic beauty. Now, if you're a car guy, or I suppose you can be a car girl, folks who just love cars, they'll, they'll wax rhapsodic about the beauty, the lines of a 57 Chevy or a 63 Corvette Stingray or whatever. There's an aesthetic, if you go back and you look at some of those old cars, they really are, there's an art, artistry about them that you don't quite get in some cars today, except the really high-end expensive ones, but there's a beauty to design. And this is what Marinetti is hinting at at this point. Okay. There's a beauty, there's an aesthetic thing. And one of the things that the, these, te these technologies can do is they're ushering in, and it's not just you know, cars and airplanes, telegraphs, telephones, they are, Marinetti argues, the harbingers, the vanguard of a new aesthetic principle, the principle of speed. The world now has encountered and is experiencing a range of sensations, simultaneous, simultaneity, dynamism, motion, driving fast. These are experiences that people before this time had not experienced. The idea of simultaneity, of two things happening at once, that's going to alter the way people begin thinking of things. You didn't have that before montage in the cinema or the telephone, that intimate relationship. And you do, when you pick up that telephone and you hear a loved one's voice, you know, you, you sense, you almost feel their presence because it's bringing them and you together in what we would today call a virtual space. They wouldn't have called it then. But it's, it's, it's a space beyond the space that we live in. And that's what they're trying to communicate with these ideas. And that, in Marinetti's view, all of this makes all the other stuff obsolete. You know, and, and the futurists, the Italian futurists, who needs museums? Who needs libraries? Throw all that crap away. We are now men and women of the modern world. We're men and women of the future. Now, oh, this is great, but what does it look like? How, how, are, you, how are you going to transmit all of this into um, artistic genres? artistic things that really are old-fashioned. How long has painting been around? Guys and gals painting on cave walls. That's how long it's been around. How are you going to communicate these sensations? How are you going to communicate these in, in a sonnet? You're going to use it as a sonnet? That, that's really an old, archaic form. So you have to find new ways of using words and images. Well, since Marinetti is a poet, he's going to focus on words. And he's going to produce a series of experimental poems and a novel poetic approach that is designed, or it's intended to reflect this age of dynamism. He calls it sound poetry. Sound poetry. It aims, as he puts it, to, put, to place words in freedom, to free up the, the, the spoken word, in this case Italian, by abandoning syntax, by abandoning punctuation, by abandoning conventional print layouts. If you if you'd looked at a newspaper from, say, the 1830s to the 1840s, uh, London Times or something like that, what you encounter in that newspaper is a wall of words, all arranged in columns, neatly laid out flat. You look at a newspaper today, what do you see? If, they, you, know, if you still read newspapers. Here, there, every, not, not as opposed to the internet, right? Here, there, and everywhere. Right? Sponsored content. I just went back and rewatched that South Park. If you haven't seen that, oh my lord. Sorry about that, that was a segue. Or, uh, I, uh, I was, that was off topic. You're going to start using different typefaces, <coughs> different sizes, different kinds of what we call today fonts, different colors. All this comes from somewhere. It comes from the futurists. This is going to amount to a radical revolution in print culture, what the futurists do in Italy and, and later we're going to see in Russia. The other thing that uh, Marinetti does is he exerts a great deal of influence on other artists, artists who work in different uh, forms because he is a relentless self-promoter. In 1912, for example, uh, a fellow by the name of Giacomo Bala is going to develop a distinctive futurist style that uses overlapping images to suggest movement. My favorite, though, one of my favorites, this is also at the Museum of Modern Art, is Umberto Bazzioni's masterpiece, uh, 1913, Unique Forms of Continuity in Space. 
Uh, Bazzioni is uh, a sculptor. He's working here in an artistic form that, by its very definition, is static. Marble, stone, what do you do? How do you impart the idea of motion? What he does in his bronze sculpture is he, he breaks the human form down into such a way as suggesting the flowing movement through the air. And this, 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 this very heavy bronze sculpture, almost, I mean, it, you look at it and you, you can see the, the human body moving because it's abstracted the body out a little bit with one leg before, one leg back, moving through space. It's regarded by, uh, by art historians as one of the real early futurist masterpieces. So futurism, of course, futurism and cubism, these, these artistic avant-garde movements are going to be born in Western Europe, but they're going to attract followers around the world. Uh, they attract followers in Europe, they attract a few in the United States. But futurism has its greatest impact in ostensibly backward Russia. It's there that these vanguard movements of artistic modernism are going to prove the most influential. Why? Well, in part because Russian artists are operating within very different contexts. They're operating uh, against a backdrop of growing political turbulence, the breakdown of social customs. All this, of course, is being accompanied by Russia's rapid industrialization. They're experiencing these technologies very quickly after, say, the Italians or the Germans are. But the difference is they're experiencing at a time that they're living side by side with those teeming millions of peasant masses who are arriving in ever and ever greater numbers into St. Petersburg and Moscow and Kiev and Odessa and Kharkov and other places. So you have this clash of the ultra-modern and the very, very old and ancient coming together. And what the artists in Russia are going to try and do is they're going to try and find ways of developing aesthetic principles and ideas that might make it possible to break out of and transcend this cultural and social conflict so that the art forms and the technology, where technology is an aesthetic thing for Marinetti and the Italian futurists, the end of futurism in Italy is to aestheticize the machine. In Russia, it's very, very different. The first group, or I should say the proto-group, out of which our Russian avant-garde emerges is a group formed in 1910 called Hylea. A small group of poets who were committed to experimenting with the written word. In 1912, they are going to now, having thought a little bit more about this, they are going to issue a manifesto of their own. We're going to follow up Marinetti's uh, Futurist Manifesto of 1909 with a manifesto that is called A Slap in the Face of Public Taste. And they rechristen their movement Cubo-Futurism. Cubo-Futurism. They're taking uh, Picasso and, and, uh, and Brock's Cubism, Marinetti's Futurism, and they're bringing them together into what they're going to call a, a Russian Cubo-Futurist movement. Russian futurists are not surprisingly going to echo some of Marinetti's uh, themes. They too will reject convention. They will call upon their countrymen, and I'm quoting here from the manifesto, to throw Pushkin, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, etc., etc., overboard from the ship of modernity. We don't need this garbage. It's old. We stand atop skyscrapers looking down on other artists. That's actually the only, re that's the only reference to technology in, the, in, the, in a slap in the face of public taste. It's a reference to skyscrapers. And where are they? They're looking down at all the other artists because they, almost in a Nietzschean way, are the supermen uh, who are standing atop and looking down on those below. The difference, though, is, the difference, though, is that Marinetti and those Italian futurists are celebrating technology as an end in itself. The Russian avant-garde embraces material objects of the modern age as figurative means for realizing a greater end. What they want to do is they want to create an entirely new form of expression that will overcome the very constraints of time and place themselves. They want to achieve, through their art, transcendent consciousness. <laughs> 
Now, in a way, we've talked about, we, we sort of hinted about this a little bit uh, many uh, weeks back when we talked about romanticism. You may, have, you may recall me discussing how romantics exalted the artist as the, the poet Byron or someone like that, whose, whose works of art were eternal and true because they somehow tapped in to the spirit of the entire universe. And that's what makes, for example, you go to the Sistine Chapel and you walk in and you look up and you're like, wow. No matter what you do, what you say, wow, you have to be amazed. No matter your race, your color, your creed, the country you're from, it's a wonder. It's a great expression of human creativity. It speaks to something transcendent and eternal. Well, what the Russian Cuba futurists want to do is they think they can create a language that is universal. They can create forms of expression that everyone will understand and that will replace all the other forms of art because they've transcended and made whole all there is. The most radical example of Russian modernism's transcendent aspirations are going to appear in the experimental poetry of these two fellows, Velimir Shevnikov and Alexei Frushonik. These are the most radical examples of the Russian avant-garde's efforts to transcend current understanding and consciousness. This is not simply Marinetti experimenting with typefaces. Yeah, the most famous example is Khrushchev's five-line poem, Dir Bolshil. This is it in Russian. Right here, it's this part. This is the title in English. I've translated it for you. The poem reads, Dir Bolshil Ubesh Shur Skum Vi So Bu R L Ez This kind of wordplay is similar. It's similar to something that Marinetti is doing in Italian. This is Marinetti's uh, collection, Zang Tum Tum. Also, not need to be translated. He writes this collection of poems, and this is an example of his words in motion, his, his words in freedom. Marinetti goes off and he observes, uh, and he reads in the newspaper reports, uh, the, uh, the, the events transpiring in the Balkans in 1912-1913. There are a series of conflicts in the, in the Balkans leading up to the First World War, and they involve things like the use of, of dirigibles for dropping grenades and things like that. And what Marinetti is trying to do in this collection, you can see the way the words sort of flow, zang, tum, tum, tum. Okay, tum, 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 tum. If you read this, and we open the book, and the words are going to be arrayed in patterns, so that one pattern looks like a, a balloon, an observation balloon, and the words you read around the balloon. The zang, tum, tum is intended to mimic the sound of artillery. The zang coming out, zang, tum, 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 as they hit. This, this, these are the neologisms, these um, onomatopoetic uh, word forms that he's going to create th that suggest sound. Suggest how do, you, how do you use a traditional form of art poetry to suggest the sound of violence of the battlefield? That's what Marinetti is doing here. And to a, in a superficial way, in a superficial way, Der Bolschul is like that. What's different, though, what's different is that the Russian Cubo futurist poems, like Der Bolschul, they want to do more than simply mimic sounds. What Khrushchev and Hrebnikov believe that they are doing is they are creating with their poetry something that they refer to as Zaumi Yazik or Zaum. This actually means something in Russian. Zaum translates literally as beyond the mind or beyond comprehension. It is a trans-rational language. In other words, these are ways of communicating that aim to get directly to the heart and the consciousness of people, but only, only by doing so by moving beyond reason. You want to escape the confines of reason to communicate a direct experience through your poetry. And in, in doing so, these Russian poets believe, to reach a higher realm of understanding in which all the contradictions of modern experience 
will be reconciled in universally accessible symbols and syllables. And this is one of the things that underscores Kroshonik's experiments. He believes that all language and all consciousness can be boiled down into basic sounds that all humans can understand. Not all of Russia's artistic experimentation is this far out there. These, kind of, these, these kinds of experiments, artistic experiments, the Russians are going to adopt. Let's go back here to these guys instead of the actual Russians. They, they draw, the Russians draw inspiration from a variety of different devices. And it's not just, transrational poetry is, is clearly the most extreme form of this. There are other more, I guess we could say prosaic, uh, examples. And those would be poems and stories that involve electric trolleys or railroad engines, motorcycles. These are going to figure prominently, increasingly, even in works of art that more tradition-minded or older poets, older artists, are engaged in. Needless to say, these guys are pretty young. What if you're a poet, a painter who's been around? Maybe you're an old fogey. You know, you're 30 or something. God forbid, and we're 35. Um, yeah, you've been you've been writing more traditional poetry. Well, those folks too now begin where you know someone might have written a sonnet about love. Um, now you're going to write a poem about the encounters on a street. So you're bringing in that urban environment to it. So these types of things are also underway in uh, in Russia, and you end up with. Uh, with poems that you're trying to uh, suggest the commotion, the traffic, the noise that you would get in, in downtown Petersburg or something along those lines. Uh, painters that previously had embraced primitivism, primitivism, because that primitivism that we saw in, in, the, in the Picasso painting, that too is going gonna, is gonna to attract attention across Europe. African art, folk art, in the Russian context, folk art's the one that's important. For, for, Fran for French artists, it makes sense that they would be attracted to African art because it's only within the last 20 years that France has begun developing its African colonies. And you have now more and more African folks traveling the Mediterranean, coming to live in, in France. They tend to be a lot more welcoming of these people, say, than the Americans are. You're not going to get a lot of primitivist American art. Primitivist in the Russian context isn't African. It's peasant. Peasant. It's peasant folk art. So that's, gonna, that's also going to have a very important role to play in the overall artistic movement of Russia at this time. But those artists who had previously focused on peasant themes are going to increasingly now start looking to factory settings and, and, and things along those lines to inspire them. Now, of all the new technologies of the era, none exerts a more profound or lasting influence on the arts and society writ large than the airplane. On the 8th of August, 1908, outside of Le Mans, France, American aviation pioneer Wilbur Wright treated a crowd of perhaps a couple hundred people to the very first demonstration in Europe of an airplane. Gathered onlookers were gobsmacked. Would-be French aviators had been trying for years, struggling, for actually for decades, to try and, and take to the air in these box-like machines. They never really amount to much more than an uncontrolled hop. The right flyer takes off into the air, it soars aloft, it deftly banks, it turns, it sweeps for an hour and 40, oh, for an hour, sorry, for a minute and 40, <laughs> a minute and 45 seconds, Wilbur demonstrates complete mastery of the air. That airplane is firmly in his control, and the Europeans are just amazed. They expected that this was another fraud. A lot of air airplane frauds, right, at this time. This was not. Wright, uh, Wright is going to go ahead and perform additional uh, demonstrations across the continent in the weeks and months to come, and it generates greater and greater and greater excitement as this mass circulation press and the, the photographs that we have of this uh, continue to expand. So the initial excitement generated by uh, Wright is going to rise to a fever pitch in July of 1909 when a Frenchman by the name of Louis Blériot crosses the English Channel in a heavier-than-air machine. The first time in history anyone had flown across the English Channel in an airplane. It had been crossed by balloons in the early 19th century. But the first time it had been done in an airplane. It's about a 36 and a half minute flight, takes off from France, crash lands, on the cliffs of Dover, and the world has changed. This sets off an absolute delirium in Europe. As news of the event spreads, Europe is seized with an absolute passion for aviation. A month later, 
and this is just, ha just happened to be fortuitous. A month later, there is a large week of aviation held in the Champagne region that attracts uh, uh, you know, about a million, a million and a half spectators because they've gotten word of Blériot's flight across the channel. So all of a sudden, everybody wants to come out and see for themselves the wonder of heavier-than-air machines flying through the skies. And after that, there are going to be copycat events. In Nice, in Monte Carlo, in Milan, there's one in, in Los Angeles and elsewhere. And millions of people are all of a sudden going to start flocking to empty fields, hastily built aerodromes to watch these, uh, these new pilots in what is now seen as being the great wonder of the age. Russians succumb to these things as well. The country's initial foray into the phenomenon of the aviation event is the first International Aviation Week that's held in St. Petersburg in May of 1910. This, it, the point of this is that 1910, coming just you know, after Blario's Crossing, and 1909, coming just after uh, the, uh, the, the Wright uh, demonstrations in 1908. The technology arrives in Russia very quickly after its debut in the West. Again, this is something we have seen time and time again uh, over the course of our discussion of, of, of Imperial Russian history. The technology arrives relatively quickly. It's the diffusion of the technology that proves to be a bit problematic. About 160,000 spectators flock to this thing. Um, and with almost, with very few exceptions, established Russian artists greet the airplane sort of as the miraculous realization of, uh, of, of age-old human dreams of flying. And we see symbolist poets and other established poets uh, you know, write poems and short stories about this, this wonderful new device. And they, they oftentimes sort of fall back on old tropes. Daedalus and Icarus figure prominently the idea of the aviator being like unto a god or a godlike being. What's particularly interesting, though, about the Russian experience, the Russian artistic experience with aviation, is the extent to which uh, several of, of the, uh, those who experience and who know and who love the technology utilize it as a way of transforming completely uh, their ways of undertaking representational art. There's no more better example of this than Vasily Kamensky, who is one of those early um, participants in Hylia and the Cubo-Futurist movement. So Kamensky is going to be our Cubo-Futurist Russian poet. It also turns out that he's an aviator. And in this, this made him different from most Russian artists. He had actually flown an airplane. In, the mid, in, in, in mid 1910, he would be taken aloft on a biplane piloted by a, a Russian um, pilot named Vladimir uh, uh, Lebedev. And the experience of, of being on that airplane is life altering for Kaminsky. He, he quits his artistic career, travels to France, takes flying lessons himself, comes back to St. Petersburg and orders an airplane from France. It's a Blériot 11. It's the same airplane that, in fact, here's one right here. <coughs> this is a Blériot 11. It's the same airplane, the same model, that Louis Blériot had used across the channel. Um, careful trial and error makes him sufficiently adept at taking off. Uh, he's not quite as good as landing, but you know th this, is, this was true actually for all the early pilots. They're basically self-taught. There's no one to teach you how to fly an airplane. In November of 1911, Kaminsky earns his, his pilot's license from something known as the, All, the Imperial All-Russian Aero Club, which had emerged out of a ballooning group from the 1880s and the 1890s. It's transformed around 1907 now into an aviation-first organization. So he gets, he gets his, uh, his pilot's license, and what most folks would have done at this point You've got a pilot's license, you've got an airplane, you're going to join what is now an emerging circuit of flyers who are attending these aviation festivals and competing for prize money. That's how they would fund their activities and draw attention to their airplanes that they were trying to sell. Kaminsky doesn't do that. He does a very Russian thing. He doesn't pursue profit. Instead, what he does is he takes his airplane on an aerial tour of provinces in, in, in largely the Polish-speaking portion of Russia. What he wants to do is he wants to drum up support and popularity for aviation. So in the spring of 1912, he begins a tour of Polish provinces organizing demonstration flights. He'll take into the air anybody who's brave enough to go with him. He'll deliver speeches, give talks, trying to get people enthused about this. 
he sees himself sort of as an aerial prophet, proselytizing aviation, until very early on in his campaign, he has a near fatal crash. Flying in the air, all of a sudden he loses control. The airplane comes crashing down into a bog. Thank God the bog was there because it, you know, it softened the impact. Destroyed the airplane, injured Kaminsky seriously, um, you know, darn near killed him. Okay, well all of a sudden he's decided you know, he's, he's going to recuperate for some time, make a couple of half-hearted attempts to fly again, but they no, no, it's not for him anymore. But what he's going to do is he's going to resume his artistic career. He's going to go back to poetry and that sort of thing, but now he's, he's still caught the bug. He's still fascinated by aviation. And his, his airborne adventure as a pilot is going to deeply influence his subsequent artistic work. Time and time again, uh, Kaminsky, who now by about 1913 or so, 1914 by this time was, was taken, he, he's taken to, to christening himself Russia's aviator poet. Russia's aviator poet. And he's going to return to the subject of flying time and time again. And it, it's, it's going to give us an example here of the ways in which this specific technology is going to alter the way uh, artists and others look at the world. Flight of Vasya Kaminsky on an aeroplane to Warsaw uh, gives us a very good example of how what Kaminsky is trying to do now is to communicate that experience of flight in a traditional form of art, poetry, in a novel and transcendent way. The instruction reads in Russian, read from bottom to top. And here's the title. And you've written in sort of that, that futuristic fashion with different type face sizes and things like that. Aeroplane, crowd, mechanics. It, it, what you see here, vetter, wind, biegut, uh, run. And as you read the individual words, the typeface grows gradually smaller and smaller as you disappear up toward the top like an airplane taking off and flying off into the horizon. That's a pretty clever thing to do. That's an example here of the ways in which the technology is altering the representation of an otherwise very traditional artistic form. A more daring, if somewhat less obvious example, is his poem, Constantinople, from 1914. This, too, is, it derives some degree of influence from Marinetti and his so-called sound poems. This. Uh, Kaminsky would take to calling this a ferro-concrete poem. If you have ferro-concrete, reinforced concrete, one of the new materials of the age, what is concrete made of? A bunch of very, very small rocks that come together, but they, they give you the, the, the illusion of a, of a seamless hole once it's poured. It looks like a bit of a mess, doesn't it? In Russian, and it's, it's all, there's, there's been an attempt to translate this into English, and it just, it just doesn't work, which is why I don't use it. Um, it appears to be random terms and letters and a few numbers that are sort of thrown together on a page that's broken up by lines. Um, it's, it's within a book. The title of the book is Tango with Cows. That's a very Cubo futurist title, Tango with Cows, because that's the sort of thing that you would do. When you look closer, however, and you read this and you read the different sections in the Russian, you begin to discern almost immediately words that are recognizable, parts of words that recall things that you might encounter in Constantinople. Sailors, sailors, sail, shore, bosphorus, coffee, bone, corals, fezes, the funny little hats, right, that the Turks will wear or the Shriners, St. Sophia, the great cathedral of, of Greek Orthodoxy in Constantinople. Right. And, you, and that, that's why you can't really translate this because some of this too, after the onomatopoetic language doesn't make sense. Uh, e ya e ya e ya and I and I and I. I. I have no doubt that the, the numbers meant something to, to Kaminsky. I haven't studied the poem in sufficient detail to tell you what those numbers specifically meant. But some of these things too are just sounds. So you've got sounds and letters and that sort of thing. What in the world is he doing? What's important here, and you know, he'll know this because I do this in the flight culture class, what Kaminsky is doing is of course Kaminsky was the aviator poet. And what he's trying to communicate through this poem is the view that the pilot has from the air looking down on the city. 
the city broken up into streets and, and, and districts and regions, and you might look down and you would see the shore if you're flying low enough. You would certainly see St. Sophia. You would certainly see the Bosphorus Peninsula. But how do you, how do you communicate that sensation of flying in poetry? Well, we saw him do it with a flight of Vasyakonsky on an airplane to Warsaw. Here's another one. It's almost like an aerial map, but it's an aerial map done in words because he's a poet. So these are the kinds of ways, and, and he refers to this. He refers to this. I should have mentioned it. There, there's no instructions. Where, where, where the other poem tells you read from bottom to top, there's no instructions, but he tells you that this is a, 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 an artistic experience. Tvorczewski uh, orbit, an artistic experience. So now you are experiencing what the aviator poet might have, he didn't fly over Constantinople, but what he might have experienced, and not that I know of anyway, had he flown over Constantinople. So here are the ways in which some of the specific ways in which technologies in general, and the airplane in particular, is altering the way in which people see the world and influencing the way artists are trying to express these sensations that are novel to the human experience. Now, the transformative potential of machine-powered flight is going to be the focus for this period's most infamous artistic production. Something known as Victory Over the Sun, which was billed as the first futurist opera. This production typified the Russian avant-garde's enthusiastic embrace of the transcendent possibilities unleashed by the technology of the Age of Synergy. The central message of the first future opera, according to Krushonik, right, our, our transrational poet, the opera was, and I quote, a defense of technology, in particular aviation, and the triumph of technology over cosmic forces and biologism. It's a collective undertaking. It's a group work that ends up upending established conventions in an effort to create a new total work of art that would eclipse all others. What the Cubio Futures are attempting to do in Victory Over the Sun is to, once again, transcend all former art forms and to create a new artistic experience that will open consciousness and open the world to something utterly new. What the technology has helped to do amongst the Russian avant-garde is to give it a sense of hope, of transformational escape from the confines of the present. The opera combined a transrational libretto that was written by Krushonik a prologue written by uh, Klebnikov uh, with a discordant musical score uh, uh, composed by a fellow by the name of Mikhail Matyushin. There are Cubist-inspired costumes. Uh, these are designed by the artist uh, uh, Kazimir Malievich. Uh, the spectacle debuts on the 2nd of December 1915, uh, 1913 in Luna Park in St. Petersburg. And those who attended were either inspired or infuriated at what they saw. Amateur actors, hidden behind masks and clothed in geometric three-dimensional outfits made from cardboard and iron thread, were recruited to perform the opera's two actions. And they move about on the stage and they recite frequently nonsensical lines. And there are spotlights crisscrossing the sets and the colors are alternating. And it's almost as if you have a Cubist painting come to life. This is the costume design put together by Malievich for one of the characters. The characters are a circus-like cast. Now, among them are time traveler, telephone talker, old timer, strong men. This is the new man. Here is sportsman. The hero, however, if the play can be said, the opera can be said to have a hero, is Aviator. He is the quintessential future person whose mechanical mastery enables liberation from the confines of earthly gravity and space. Now we don't know exactly what this looks like because we don't have pictures of it. We have the costume designs. These are preserved. This, this particular event, this opera, has enjoyed a great resurgence in recent years. And the closest that we can get to what this may have looked like, I think is a Moscow production that was undertaken just last year in 2014. This is in 1913. 
This is in 1913. Okay. It's Aviator who is the hero. And what transpires at the culminating moment of this play is, and this is what, this is what it says in the notes for the opera, music, the noise of machines. And audience members would hear a droning motor followed by, quote, an unusual noise, an airplane falling. A broken wing falls to stage. A fuselage lands. And all of a sudden, figures dressed in these freakish geometric costumes rush around, the, the, uh, rush around it, and they begin dancing in these odd ways and reciting things like Durbel Shul, all these sounds that don't mean anything but are intended to evoke, as um, the, uh, the score tells us, they make these sounds that suggest somersaults and people tumbling downward. Suddenly, as they're dancing around making these noises off stage, we hear Aviator laugh aloud before he makes his entrance and he says, I am alive. It's just the wings are a bit tussled and this boot here. Then suddenly two strong men come to the stage and they recite, All's well that begins well and has no end. The world will perish, but there is no end for us. And with that, the curtain falls. Victory Over the Sun was an intensely polarizing experience. Tradition-minded observers decried it as an absolute scandalous affront to culture and to taste. But more forward-looking contemporaries embraced the production. They saw it as being an, an adequate and appropriate artistic response to the ongoing material transfiguration and transformation underway in Russia. A transfiguration that's being brought about by the machines, the technology, the science, the ways of trying to make sense about what's going on all around, trying to come to some sort of a new understanding of what it means to be alive in this particular age, at this particular time. What particularly resonated with those who liked Victory Over the Sun was the opera's exaltation, above all, of machine-powered flight in the opera's concluding action because it held out hope that all's well that begins well and has no end. The world will perish, but there is no end to us. That is a hopeful expression of what is to come. It's a hopeful expression of a brighter, better future, even if the costumes uh, look pretty odd uh, by any standard. These types of artistic experiments that are being undertaken by the Cuba futurists in Russia are going to end up being profoundly influential in the late 19-teens and the 1920s. They will give rise to new artistic movements during the Soviet phase of Russian history. New artistic movements and ways of expression that are going to deeply influence uh, not only Soviet culture but European culture as well in the 1920s before they are going to be crushed in the 1930s with the onset of the Stalinist Revolution. The point of all this, and we're going to give you guys a chance to break a little bit early tonight and stretch your legs, the point of all of this is that Russia is in the midst of a thoroughgoing cultural transformation. There's an attempt being made by the nation's leading artists, established artists, who are writing about technology increasingly, but also the elements of its avant-garde who are looking for new ways of expressing their thoughts and their emotions the sensations that they are feeling as a result of all these technological and urban transformations surrounding them. What the Russians are doing is really no different in essence, I mean the effort I should say is no different than what Picasso or Brock were doing with the original Cubism in 1907. But the Russians are going to add something to it and what they add to it is that sense of transcendent desire. Marinetti, I mean Picasso is experimenting influenced by x-rays and, and theory of relativity. Marinetti wants to make the machine into an, into an object of aesthetic appeal. What the Russians do is, in typical Russian trait, carry it a step forward. They don't just want to aestheticize the machine. They see the machine as a vehicle for transfiguration, for creating an entirely new way of understanding, comprehending, the world around them, and in doing so, creating the world anew. This is that transfigurative impulse in Russian culture that I talked about at the very beginning of, this, of, of the semester. It is one that is going to come fully into life in October of 1917, 
with the Bolshevik Revolution and the attempt to create literally the world anew by establishing the world's first uh, communist state. Right. And there are members of, of, of the Cuba Futurist in Hylea, in particular Vladimir Mayakovsky, who are going to embrace the Bolshevik Revolution as the beginning of a new world and the, un the unleashing of all of these experiences, these new ways of understanding that break entirely with the old world and usher in the new age. But for that, you've got to come back next semester. If you come back after the break, we'll talk a little bit more concretely about airplanes, and we will segue into the First World War.